Thanks very much for the introduction. Um, as um, Andrew alluded to, I think I've spoken at all but one of the um, forums about the Silmeet module, and so it's finally time to deliver. Um, so, um, the, the, meat, the inside sill, we don't run all of the breeding values together because that's far too big a job. It's compartmentalized into traits that go together. So the growth module has all of the live weights, the wool module has all of the wool, wool traits, the meat module has all of the stuff that we need to predict things to do with meat. And um, the thing that's different about the meat module, there are a few things that are peculiar to it. It's a really expensive thing to go through and analyze meat um, because we don't kill a lot of animals in our studs. So the research is really exper um, exp um, very expensive to do. So the last time we actually did this what in, in, a, in a really good, full way for the industry, it's actually a, a once in a generation thing. So many of the genetic parameters that we're talking about actually date back to an experiment that was done in the late 1980s and published in the 1990s by Dan Waldron. A few of the older people might remember uh, that name, but it was done in Romney and Romney cross animals. Um, I think they were sourced up around Fota Fota. And at the time, um, the industry was a little bit lower, but the carcasses that we had were 14.6 kilograms for the carcass weight, and they had um, a GR of seven millimeters. And if you think today, you know, that's, that's 30 years of change in our industry, which is a massive amount of change. We've talked about changes in computing and things like, uh, things like that. But today, we've got a far greater diversity in terms of the breeds and the breed crosses that we have in our industry. We've got much heavier carcasses, and they have less fat. And um, there are a great range of technologies that we never had. When it was originally done, um, ultrasound was a pretty new technology on, the, on the, the ground, so we had live weights and ultrasound, but since then we've brought in a whole lot of additional measurements, and these are continuing to go. So we've got, um, we've got some implant processing, and at the moment you can have via scan records in SIL, but other meat processors have other grading systems. Some scientists have come up with some systems that they're using, and new systems are being developed. And in addition, we've got um, CT. Um, and all of that data goes in. So it's, a, it's not the biggest module in terms of the number of animals that, have it, have, um, that are recorded, but it's by far the biggest in terms of the number of traits that are recorded, which creates a lot of problems for us when we're trying to analyze it. So 30 years of change. Um, it's, it's a massive amount of change, and so just to try and give you some idea, I don't want to start any Ford versus Holdens uh, fights in, in the crowd, but this uh, uh, pictures of two 1992 cars, which still actually to me don't look that old, and if you look around Dunedin, you'll probably see plenty, plenty of these driving around. But when you compare it to the cars of today, there's been a massive change in those in terms of, they, they're still cars, still drive you around, take the same number of people, but in terms of the safety, the technology, all of those things, there are massive changes that have occurred over the last 30 years. So let's have a look at what are the differences in terms of the type of product that we're producing now? So here's our uh, 2018 carcass. Um, in, the, in the data set that, I've, um, that we've generated over the last four years, the average carcass weight is 18.5 kilograms. I think we're about 18.6, 18.8 national average, so we're right on that. But we don't sell carcasses. If you were there last night, most carcasses are broken down. So here we've got um, our, our loin and um, our chop, and here's the eye muscle area, which uh, you can't see the red probably very well, but there, and we, it's, it's meat, so here is the, the meat that we've produced off that carcass. So we've currently got an average of around about 14.0 square centimeters in our eye muscle, which is a reasonable size, and we're producing about 11.1 .1 kilograms of saleable meat. I haven't mentioned fat, I'll come back to it in a moment, but if we look at the carcasses that were around in that data set that were generated in 1988, 14.6 kilograms, so we, uh, we've lost 20, we've, we've gained about 25%. There was only 79% of the carcass weight produced back then. In terms of our eye muscle area, 9.1 centimeters, so very small, a tiny little, uh, one of the old 50 cent coins in terms of the, the loin that we had on the chop and we were producing 7.8 kilograms of meat off that carcass. And if you just look at those two, um, two figures there, the, 
the 65% is less than our 79, and our 70% is less than our... So we've actually increased our eye muscle and the weight of meat at a faster rate than, we, than we've increased carcass weight. So what's changed? The remainder is fat, and if we have a look at that, it, back in 1988, on our 14.6 kilogram carcass, we had 3.1 kilograms of fat. On our 18.5 kilogram carcass, we've only got 2.5 kilograms of fat. Everything else has gone up, and we would expect that fat would kind of trend along, but we've put massive selection pressure on producing leaner animals, and so we've got an animal that's much heavier, but much leaner. So the, um, the meat module dates right back to the very start. The core part of that is the same as when SIL began um, almost 18 years ago. The genetic parameters come from there, and we've added new subsets of value as new technologies um, have come along. There are some features in that data set, um, sorry, there are some features in the, in the meat module. They were done for good reason at the time because of computing capability and things like that so that we could produce breeding values, but we've now got the ability to um, look into those and actually do some, try and make these things better. So one of those was that the computing ability placed um, limits on the, on the analysis that we could do. So our current analysis is actually split into two. You get one set of breeding values from it, but we actually have a bit of software that just does the fat traits and another bit of software that does just the lean traits. So we have now the opportunity to try and put those together. The other thing is that we're limited in the number of traits that we can analyze together. So in the current meat module, our live animal CT traits are set as the goal trait, as if they're perfect. And CT is very, very good, but it's not perfect. And so what we're, what we're, going, what we're doing in the new module is we're actually, we've got a measure of, of a new gold standard, which um, I'll talk about in a moment. So we're predicting, using everything to predict our gold standard rather than saying one of the traits that we have in there um, is the gold standard. And so this redevelopment is giving us the opportunity. A lot of those barriers have gone, and so it really is um, the opportunity to make some good changes to try and fix some of these, these issues. So on to what we've actually done. As you've, you've heard me say, we've been redeveloping this over the last four years. And so at the core of it, what we've got is one set of animals that we've been able to measure all of the current traits that are in the cell meat module. And so that means in addition to the live weights and the ultrasonic eye muscle measurements, we took them to um, Inverme and we CT scanned them with the live animal um, six slice CT protocol. They were slaughtered at Alliance's Longville plant and we got via scan measurements from those. And then we took the carcasses back, we cut them up into their primal cuts, so the, the shoulder, loin, hind leg and flap. And then we did what we call spiral CT scanning. So this is, um, we completely sampled the carcass. So the carcass was fed in, we took a, a slice, we, um, over every part, a five millimeter thick slice at five, milli in, five millimeter intervals. So we sampled the entire carcass and measured very, very accurately the weight of lean and fat and bone in each of those cuts, which is just as accurate as having some poor um, honor student sitting down with a scalpel on a carcass um, and, and much less um, tedious and, and a bit faster. So that's our new gold standard and that's what we're predicting um, out. So, Things are, we've been talking about changes that are coming and a result part of this is that we're going to get, potentially get some changes in the breeding values as they come through. And the first and most important thing, so there are some things driving it, but the first thing to note is that the aim is that we're trying to do a better job. Um, Steve said that um, the um, EBV does not mean um, we're, we're doing it perfectly, that it's estimated, so we're trying to do a better job of estimating it. What we're doing is there's, there's two ways that this um, change is being driven. The first is that there's new trait data that's going in there, and um, I'll talk through those, um, and also that there's a change in the genetic parameters coming. So in terms of the new trait, there is data that we've not previously included in previous analyses, analyses that have been collected, and there are some new goal traits. Both of those are going to mean that there is going to be a little bit of change. And in terms of the genetic parameters, we've updated the heritability, so how much of it is transferred. The, we've looked at the animals that we had 30 years ago, we've scaled the data up are those numbers actually fit for purpose? Have we fundamentally changed our animals enough that we need to look at those? So we're looking at how much, what's the observed 
variation that we see, and what are the phenotypic and genetic relationships between those traits. And all of those will go into the new module. So in terms of new traits, um, some of you will be aware, but probably it's not terribly well known, that the carcass weight in the existing um, evaluations, carcass weight actually comes out of the growth module. So it's a growth trait. Um, we're, we're growing the animals in order to produce a carcass of a certain size. So the data that goes into predicting it are live weights. It's not actually currently predicted in the meat module. And any carcass data that was in there it was set to zero because we don't have much carcass data. Um, it's not something that we normally do, or it, it wasn't something that we normally normally did. Now, with all the progeny tests and things that we're doing, there's actually quite a lot of carcass data that's gone in, partly through the central progeny test, partly through other progeny tests that are going on. So the carcass BV is now going to come out of the meat module, and it's going to use any carcass data that's in there, plus all the the meat measurements that we use, including ultrasound and CT, in order to do that. Our goal traits, um, as I said, we're, we're changing those from being our live animal CT, which although very good are not perfect, to our basically our very, very best estimate of that. The BV names, the EBVs that you get, are not going to change. You're going to see the same names what we're doing is we're changing the way that we predict them. So they're just going through a, a, an extra step there. So in terms of your reports, you're going to see the same report. They'll have the same trait names, but there's just a bit more involved in predicting them. In addition to that, um, we have currently, we've got Viascan data as our, our meat processor system because They've been working with beef and lamb genetics with the central progeny test, and we've got a lot of information. But um, last year I talked about the fact that progressive meat system, their marrow um, grading system also measures yield, and so we've been working for their, with them for a couple of years. That's been measured um, at the Horizon um, Farming Limited um, a next generation progeny test site. So the intention is that we'll bring that in so their data can just go into SIL, and that will inform the breeding values. Um, AgriSearch have been measuring carcass weight, GR, and a butt score um, to do some better predictions um, and work that they've been doing, so we've got a calibration data set for that. And we're also building it that as other grading systems come online, we're able to integrate those without having to add to the bulk of the, the system. So there's a pathway there for other sister, systems, whether that's DEXA, um, that the, the Scott people are working on with Silver Fern, or, or other systems like that. They can be included without causing major disruptions and, and requiring a major redevelopment of the meat module. So I've just got a few um, uh, um, tables here just to go through the observed differences. So what, we, what we've done is, as we've added new traits, we've done some small experiments um, to look at um, what Viascan brings, what CT brings, but we haven't been able to revisit the entire, do an experiment where we were able to measure everything in all animals. And so part, partly we have been scaling up the numbers that have come from those animals that were measured back in 1988 to 1992, and we've, we've scaled them up and said, well, is this variation um, the right amount of variation for the animals we've got today? And now we've got the opportunity to actually look at it. These things will drive the spread, partly drive the spread of the breeding values that we have. And so if we just look down these things, what we've got here is our, um, our traits down here, weaning weight and live weight eight. Um, our, then we've got our ultrasound data, FDM is um, the fat depth, EMD, I've lost the dot, it'll come back, where is it, there we, our ultrasound measurements, eye muscle depth and eye muscle width, and you can see that there are substantial numbers of records for these, so we, we're not just using the animals that we um, did our experiment on, but we were able to go back and access those animals in the flocks that they came from. So significant numbers of animals, 158,000 animals with weaning weight in our, in our analysis, and for live weight eight, 116,000. And if we have a look at those, what we've got here is the old phenotypic standard deviation that we had um, under the existing system and the new ones in the column beside it for, um, that we measured. What I've said in our differences is that anything that's less than 10%, they're fairly minor changes, so we're not really going to look much at those. But if you look at weaning weight, our first one, 
the variation that we're seeing in the animals that we have today is 22% greater than scaling up from the animals that we had. That's probably not a big surprise for you because you know you think we, we pretty much had a Romney-based industry. We've now got a lot of breed importations, animals that grow faster, but we still have some traditional breeds. So we're seeing more variation in weaning weight. So there's probably, we, we don't get the weaning weight BV out of the meat module, it comes from the growth module, but it provides information for all of these meat systems. So it's going to have a, have a bit more impact. Um, live weight 8 was, was pretty good. Um, these, these two fat depths were not um, less than 10%, but our eye muscle width went, has actually got a little bit larger. So it's the, the, our eye muscles have got a little bit wider than we have predicted from scaling up our, um, our animals from 1988. In terms of um, via scan, we've got, once again, we've got a good number of animals here, 30,000 animals coming in from central progeny test mostly, but some other, um, so, some other progeny test flocks, so there's a good number of animals there. And what we've seen is that um, we've, got a, we've got a bit of a drop, we've probably slightly overestimated the amount of variation that we're getting in those via scan traits. Not by a major amount, 13 to 19%. But, but their BVs will shrink a little bit because we've got a little bit less variation and we'll do it. Our carcass weight, we're pretty much spot on. Our old standard deviation was two kilograms and our new one is, is 2.07. So we, that scaled up very well. And in terms of our live animal CT and our hind leg, loin and shoulder, in the animals that we developed it on, there was a bit more variation than when we've looked at the industry. So those will also come back a little bit as well. So they've come back. But here's, the, here's once again, fat. Fat has undergone a major, we've really pulled a massive amount of fat out of our carcasses as we've grown. So the old standard deviation, 1.68, and our new standard deviation, 0.67. So a 60% reduction in that. So the, the shrink, the, that should be pulling our, our breeding values back, um, the, the range in breeding values back a bit. Now, I'm going to put up a, a, another table. And um, there are some people that love numbers. And I've removed them. You'll have to come and speak to me later. What I'm trying to show you is I'm trying to explain the behavior where changes are coming. So I've put what's called a heat map, which I'll talk you through. But what I'm looking at is between the, the heritabilities and the genetic parameters that we've used in the past and the new ones that are coming out, where are the changes coming from that are going to tr drive a change in breeding values? So I'll just build this picture up slowly. What we've got here are all the traits that we currently have in um, the new meat module, which goes from um, our, our weaning weight. Oh, I'm not. If you, we just walk down that column, weaning weight, live weight eight, our ultrasonic measurements down to eye muscle area, our via scan traits, and then our CT traits. These are the traits that are the same in the two modules. And then you'll see on the diagonal here, we have our heritabilities going along there. And so I've got a scale that's going from red to blue. If it's got a very red number, it's, got a, it's increased quite a bit. If it's got a blue number, it's dropped quite a bit. And the more red, then the more change, the more blue, then the more change. And if they're white, they're just in the middle. And if you'll see, we've got two numbers there that are very red. Our weaning weight breeding value that we've got, the, our weaning weight heritability that we've got has gone up quite a lot in this data set, and also our eye muscle area. And our hind leg one has, our CT hind leg has dropped a little bit. Most of the rest are not, are not too bad. They're not massive, um, they're not big changes. And the, the reds are a greater up 23% than our drop down, which is at negative 6%. So this is not going to impact on your weaning weight breeding value because weaning weight doesn't come from this model. But Weaning weight contributes to all of the other breeding values. Weaning weight is measured on every animal. Very few animals are CT scanned. So it goes into predicting those. And then if we have a look here, um, what we've got is the genetic correlations. There are some white squares that have, or rectangles that have absolutely nothing in them. These ones here, that's because they, they weren't used, because we split the analysis in two, they never, those ones never occurred, so we can't compare them. But, um, we didn't ever run, um, uh, for example, fat depth with any of the via scan traits here. So the point to note is that 
We've got red here for all of the weaning weights. We've underestimated a little bit our ability to predict our later traits from weaning weight. So that's a good thing. Every animal has a weaning weight. We're going to do a better job of predicting our meat yield by, from the weaning weight data that we've collected. Live weight 8 has a fair a bit of, of red, so it goes along with weaning weight. They're highly correlated, so it will go up as well. And the other thing is, over here in our blues, um, in, our, in our via scan, they um, are all slightly overestimated, so there's going to be our, our CT and via scan, there's a little bit more difference there than we predicted. That's dropped a little bit um, for all of those. So just the adjustments between the different scanning technologies, you know, those numbers, they were doing the right thing, but we're doing a better job of adjusting for those. So all of these are going to just have a bit of an impact on um, the results that come out. So our breeding values are going to change. So we're actually at the moment, we're in testing. Um, these, just as everything, the aim is that we're going to get them out um, by August, and I'll talk about the time frame just at the end. But just to give you kind of an idea about the change that's going to come, this is a comparison of the NZGE carcass weight um, EBV coming from the meat module. So this is our revised one on this scale, on this scale here, um, on, our, on our vertical axis, and our carcass weight that came from the growth module, um, so our existing carcass weight BV. So what you see is that there is um, a, a good relationship between it. High animals are high and low animals are low, but there's quite a bit of difference that's coming to the carcass weight breeding value. This is because it's, in the old system, it was just predictive from weaning weight, live weight 8, and live weight 18. Um, now it's being predicted from weaning weight, live weight 8, the ultrasound measurements, the via scan measurements, any carcass data that's in there, that's, that's in there. So um, we are, in moving it, we're going to get um, some changes. If, um, we are going to use that carcass weight data where it's available, so all that progeny test data is now going in to inform the carcass weight um, breeding value. Our ultrasound, via scan, and CT data is going to help. The thing, the reason why, I haven't got any other graphs the re, because we're still working through those, but the reason that this is important is that this is also going to impact on our yield traits because we adjust all of our, our, lean, by, our lean depot traits by carcass weight. So the fact that we've changed and given a more accurate estimate for carcass weight means that will impact on our yield um, breeding value, so that will change as well. So timeline for application, just to wrap things up. So the new parameters are done, um, and they are in testing at the moment. So what we're doing is just doing graphs like that and making sure that we're happy with the results that we have. We also have to make sure that it runs in the required amount of time. So the breeding values that um, I've got there, they ran in about three hours, but um, we started the job a week ago, and Cheryl Ann hasn't told me that we've actually managed to finish calculating the accuracies yet. So as accuracies are part of um, the, the process, we still have to do some simplification and that to get it down to the number of traits that we can run before we pass it over to Michael for single step because he's pretty, he's looking out rather scared over there at the moment at the number of traits that we've currently got in there. So we will be simplifying it down. Um, and there are some groups who, um, who have um, noticed in their, in their data that there are some biases that are caused with some of the more advanced measurements when CT or via scan data are in there. So we'll certainly be trying to work with some of those groups just to have a look and do reality checks to make sure that some of the, the, the carryovers from the past system, the old system, that we do actually iron those out as we go forward. So the aim is that we're going to release these into the live system um, in still in August. And for that, we will just be using the data that currently goes into that. So that's all the ultrasound, the CT data, and at the moment, it, we've got Viascan as our only meat processor system. Um, but the Merrill system and the AgriSearch um, GR and Butt score one will be incorporated so that they can be used um, in October. And, and any other, there's a pathway there for any other grading systems that come in. So. Um, it will be, so by the time um, it rolls around for next selection, all of this should be live um, and, and you will have had a chance to have a good look at those breeding values before your next lot of RAM selections are made. So that's enough from me. I've left only a few minutes for uh, some questions. Yeah, Neville, uh, how flexible are the parameters going to be, and I guess in particular fat, uh, to actually change that without waiting another 30 years? Uh, sort of looking at that, there's a whole heap of other reasons that 
where we are today is probably too lean, uh, and that possibly where we were 30 years ago with today's current carcass isn't probably a mile away. So, so really good question. So what we've been doing is the, the breeding values. So all the breeding values tell you is where the animal sits. It doesn't actually drive direction. That's done through the indexes. So the, the next part of the work plan will be that we, you know, so while we've only re-estimated these once every, you know, 30 years, the indexes have been redone on a number of occasions over time. And they can be, they can be done, you know, um, at any time. So that's the thing that sets direction. So you could make fat positive and you could actually greatly increase the amount of fat that we have on our, on, um, in, in our selection index now. So we could start increasing fat. You know, we haven't talked about intramuscular fat. That's not going to go into here. That's going to go into the meat quality um, thing. But, but if we start increasing those things, then uh, we're probably going to have to have a positive on fat in order to make that happen. That's set through the indexes, which is a, a separate part to this, and that can be done at any time. So that can be quite flexible. Um, for, for us, measuring the traits on farm, um, with all the measuring you've done to try and work this out, um, at ultrasounding, say, sort of 500 ram lambs at 4 or $5 a head versus... CT scanning 100 at 100 a head. Um, there's, there's a big difference in cost, obviously. Um, which is going to give us the better data for a, um, our flock to, for the meat? So uh, it, it comes down to how many you actually do. So it's a little bit like Michael's Depends um, answer that he had earlier. But what, what I should say is that you should be ultrasound scanning. Like if you're, that's, it's relatively cheap. It's relatively accurate, and it can be done on your farm, so you can do a large number of animals and get a good sample. So, so you should all be ultrasound scanning. Then it comes down to, should I be doing some more advanced measurements? And you don't make you know, an extra 100 or 200 or $300 a ram because it's been CT scanned. So you have to look at how many animals can I scan. If you're only scanning one or two rams a year through CT, it's, it's a marketing exercise, not a genetic improvement one, so you need to scan probably at least, you know, um, the, the optimum percentage to CT scan to, to make the most, gain, uh, the most gain is about 10 to 15 percent, that there's not really many people that are scanning that number. So, you know, you can still make progress at scanning 5 percent, you're probably still making a little bit at 3 percent. Via scan's kind of the same thing, you're measuring from the, except you're measuring from the bottom part, you're, you're killing cull animals, not your very best animals that you're going to use, so you probably need a great, to, to kill a greater number if you're going to use, uh, um, a greater number than you would CT scan if you're going to use that. So do ultrasound and do it well, and then consider can I, do I want to take it to the next level, should I, should I use CT? And, and you have to look at the cost benefit on the number of animals that you can scan and how much you think that that will drive, uh, th how much that will drive your genetic progress forward and how much more market share or more per ram you might be able to get for that. Um, yeah, in that answer you, you said that ultrasound was quite accurate. Um, in the past we've been led to believe that ultrasound wasn't very accurate. I mean, can you, so, so is it, have you got a correlation figure between? Yeah, so it's, ultrasound is a, if you look at the experiments, it's about 40 to 50% accurate at predicting the, um, the weight of lean, and about 60 to 70% at predicting the weight of fat. So it's, it's moderate, you know, and we've made really good genetic progress on the back of that. You know, there's still plenty of room for improvement, but if you are gonna, if you can um, ultrasound scan I don't know what number you said, but if you could, if you could ultrasound scan 80% of your ram lambs, you're going to make more progress than scanning CT scanning, you know, one um, one lamb per sire with CT. So it's it's more of a fat, it's more on fat than it is on lean, but you get benefits from both. Yeah, Neville, Alan Richardson. There's a wee bit of chatter in the industry that people getting their scanners in to test for IMF. Um, what's your take on that? Is it, um, is it accurate or is it um, a wee bit more fantasy than fact? So, so I'm aware that they're doing that and I haven't seen any, any data. Um, 
What, what I will tell you is that it, it's, it, for the physics of it, it's a pretty big ask to do. So in cattle, where there is quite good experimental evidence, it's, it's good enough for a research tool, uh, sorry, it's good enough for a selection tool so you can make some genetic progress, but you wouldn't use it to draft animals to go off to slaughter. Sheep have less intramuscular fat than cattle by quite a substantial margin, so I, they won't be more accurate the cat, for, than the cattle people, they're probably less accurate. And the correlation for the beef, um, the, the, the papers I've seen are at that 30 to 40% accurate at predicting IMF. So it, I don't think it can be better than that. Thank you, Jock Allison. Can you select for intramuscular fat while holding your um, back fat um, the same? Or are they inextricably linked? So, a very good question. So I've, we, we've been doing a little bit of work at InnoVision on that, and there's some work from around the world. The, the answer is that they are very tightly linked, but there are, but that doesn't mean that you can't do some selection for it. So as long as the number of traits is is small, that you're just trying to improve intramuscular fat, there's the possibility that you can do a little bit of decoupling, and so it would take a long time. Um, if you're talking about scanning in a dual purpose thing where you're also selecting for um, fertility and uh, parasite resistance, then your ability to pull it apart is you know, probably very small. Um, Matt Holden, Neville, <coughs> there's obviously a bit of talk that the sheep have got leaner over the last 30 years. So why, as an industry, do we refer to meat as lean? Uh, so that we refer to lean as, <laughs> it's, an it's a really funny uh, term, I guess. Lean just means the non-fat tissues. So a, a lean animal has, uh, doesn't have much, has a lot of meat or, or not much fat. Yeah, it's just kind of an old term that we use. I'm just wondering whether we should just call it meat. <laughs> Probably a good idea. <laughs> Will breeding for IMF be necessary if chilled packaging creates tenderness en route to market? Oh, sorry, I, was, I, I thought it was a statement. Sorry, was there a question? Could you repeat the question, Derek? Sorry. Will breeding for IMF be necessary if chill technology creates tenderness in the product en route to market. Oh, so, sorry, I, I thought it was a statement. So the, the, it's a, the fat component contains flavor, um, so it's, it affects things a lot more than simply tenderness. So that our tenderness is pretty good, but it's also juiciness, flavor, the eating experience. So it's, th there are things that it brings that are more than simply um, tenderness related. So the tenderness thing, Shipping and, as you say, electrical stimulation, aging, all those things do a pretty good job, but there are other attributes that IMF brings. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neville. I can see why it took four years of work to get to this point. So a big thank you for our three speakers this morning, um, Andrew, uh, David and Neville. Uh, how about another round of applause for them? <laughs>